I didn't tell you earlier, but I'm the, uh, I'm the official the manatee whisperer like here at the park. So if anybody's going to buy manatees for you, even on days that I'm not supposed to do boats, I come out here and hang out with my girls out here on the river. We love our manatees here at the it's park. Kind of <laughs> Look, but they, uh, they can see us up here on the river, on the boat just as clearly as we can see them when the water's nice and clear like this. And they'll come over and they'll lift their head right out of the water. About every three to five minutes they come up for a breath of air. And they'll look you straight in the eye. They, uh, they're definitely intrigued by humans. So this is our first boat tour of the morning and we typically try to get a beginning of the day tally on how many manatees we see. So I'll be counting them as we see them. But there's a couple of spots in the, uh, in the river here where they like to hang out. And so I'll definitely be looking for uh, some of their hideouts as we go down the river. I'll point them out as we go down the river there. It was a good view. What are the better views? You probably see a bunch of these big birds, these big black birds hanging out in the trees here. Those are black vultures. We have, uh, this is the time of the year, we still have most of our migratory birds are in the park here. We've got four or five species that are here. They actually picked a great time of the year to be here. We got manatees. There's a big female over to the left over there. See it right right on the edge. It looks like a big gray log. She's laying down at the bottom of the river there eating grass. They look like big old potatoes sticking up. Yeah, we're gonna see a bunch of them today. It was, the weather was a little cool last night. That's what pushes them up into the river. And the amazing thing about these guys, as big as they are, manatees only have about 4% body fat. So they're really susceptible to well, hypothermia. So when the weather gets cold, they got to come up to these springs to stay uh, to stay warm. Otherwise, they get hypothermia. You got a whole bunch of them over here on the left. It's got a baby. If you've been here before, you may notice that the river is incredibly clear right now. Uh, our water quality of the spring water stays pretty stable, but what changes pretty regularly is the clarity. And uh, boy, that's a huge female back there. So the, the clarity, uh, unfortunately, during Christmas week this year, our clarity in the river was only about three feet. And so even in the water that we're in right now, we're in about five feet of water. The manatees were here, but we couldn't see them because the minute they went down to the bottom to eat grass, they went out of view because of the clarity of the water. So when you can see all the way across the river and uh, see the bottom, it's really nice water clarity here in the spring. There's an interesting bird over there with its wings on the left with its wings spread out. That's a female Anhinga. And uh, she's got her wings spread out because she's one of two birds we have here in the park that are bottom feeders. The other ones are our cormorants. And so they basically well, the take a deep team. breath and they go to the bottom of the river and all that eel grass down there looking for things to eat. So that's why they have to come up and spread their wings out and dry their feathers. Otherwise they can't uh, they can't fly. So you'll see a lot of those birds out here standing on stumps and trees with their wings all spread out. There's another one laying on the bottom over there. The Anhinga? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. By the color of their feathers. Anhingas, uh, the females have a blonde neck and shoulders, and the males are completely black. It's one of the few birds we have out here that we can really, it's really easy for us to identify the males and the females. There's a male on that stuff there. Can't see it very well, but. Oh, so we're turning the corner here. We're kind of leaving civilization behind, and we're going to head down on the uh, on the Wild Wakulla River here. And I always love doing the 940 boat. It's the first time of the day. The animals are just kind of getting up to speed out here. And get good lighting for photographs this time of the day, so it's a uh, it's a great time to be out here on the river. Although anytime we come out, we come out here raging rainstorms and it's still a nice day to be out here in the river. Yeah. There's a gator over there. A gator. Yeah, I see our first little gator oh, over there. We should probably oh, see about 30 to 50 gators with the with the sun being out like this. And uh, there's going to be times, certain areas, a lot of them are going to be on the opposite shore. We'll see those on the return trip of the river. Here's another ant hanging right here. That's a good one. That's a male. He's got his, he doesn't have that blonde neck and shoulder. So standing wow. there on the edge of the river spreading its wings out. Our park here uh, consists of about 6,000 acres and way back in the 1930s Ed Ball decided he wasn't going to log any of it so we got about 5,000 acres of virgin timber in the park here. So we got some beautiful trees here in the park. But probably the most interesting trees are the ones that are growing out here in the middle of the river which are called bald cypress trees. And uh, this is actually the time of the year when they are bald. In the summertime, they look like they have needles on them, like pine trees, but they're not evergreens. They actually are deciduous. They lose their needles every year. 
But you look around the base of a lot of these cypress trees, and you see these big stumps coming out of the ground around the base of the tree. Those are known as cypress knees. Uh, really good picture of them. And they're actually an extension of the root system of the tree. A lot of these trees in the river here are between 250 and 300 years old. And uh, they've been standing out here in the middle of the river for centuries, even with the hurricane force winds that we get out here. So it's uh, really important that you, you see how important those cypress knees are and the broad base of these trees for the stability of them out here in the middle of the river. Very rarely we ever see cypress knees get blown over. There's a couple of beautiful little birds out in the middle of the river there. You see those blackbirds with the snow white beak? It's called an American coot. Uh, those are migratory birds and they're related to another bird that we have here in the park called the common moorhen. The moorhens live here year round. The American coots, they come in in the fall and they'll be leaving shortly. Oh, is that an osprey? Yeah. Up in the nest. Up in the nest. Oh, it is. It's, uh, we'll be able to see it again when we come back. The ospreys are working on that nest again. We'll get a really good view of it on the return trip up the river. This is the fourth year in a row now that those, uh, those ospreys have come back to utilize that nest and They've been up there rebuilding the, the nest now the last couple of weeks, but it looks in pretty good shape right now. Actually, I'm seeing some of these cypress trees. We've had enough warm weather. They're starting to put out their new needles for this year. In the winter time, when they lose their needles, you get to see how much of that Spanish moss is hanging on them in the winter time, but they green up pretty nice in the spring. And everything looks completely different here between the four seasons of the year, so we're just starting to get our, our spring uh, foliage starting to come back out in our trees here. Now that bird sitting on the stump over there, that's the other bird, like the anhinga, that's a double-crested cormorant. And both of those birds are bottom feeders, so that one also feeds off the eelgrass on the bottom of the river. They look for little minnows and uh, crayfish and things like that down there to get, and they'll stand up there and spread their wings out as well. That one's a cormorant right there. Uh, that, I can't tell. The cormorants, they don't have any difference, uh, difference in their, their uh, plumage, so it's, it's tough to tell the males from the females. This area that we see on the right hand side here, this is the only human development that you'll see in this whole stretch of the park. That was actually put in back in the 1950s by Ed Ball. Ooh, beautiful red blue hair. It's, it's kind of like wildlife overload out here today. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Ed Ball put that in back in the 1950s. We call it what we call a roller coaster, but it's actually that's our boat maintenance area. So we got a trolley, a special trolley we go over into the river with a big wind. We drive these boats right up on that trolley to pull them up the water for maintenance. And that's part of the reason why we like to pull the boats out of the water. Yeah, none of us, none of us uh, rangers are big fans of standing in a river full of alligators oh, doing oil changes. That's yeah. nice to pull them out of the water. And yes, that is a real alligator. Have you seen enough alligators? During the week, we do a lot of boat There's going to be a bunch on the other side. We have the boats to convince them that these are real alligators. That we put on the side of the boat. I'm like, no, there's just oh, there's a big man to you. Really there's a couple. Oh, see, look at these moving. That's because I pushed the, I pushed the button to damage. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, I had a bunch of fourth graders out here, and I had one 10 year old boy who was just not believing it. So I'll pull the boat over and you can jump out and poke it and see if it's plastic or not. He's like, no, I'll take your bird for it. Would you see them start swimming around like that? Oh, I love it. Did you see it? Hey, he did. He got swimming. Cool. Our park biologist estimates that we've got about three to four hundred gators that live in the park here. And so uh, we don't we see probably about 10 percent of them on any given boat tour. A lot of them hang out in the, in the uh, cypress swamps on both sides of the river. But we definitely have a lot of them. We're just now getting into the breeding oh, season. Are out there. So their activity is yeah. starting to pick up quite a bit yeah. now. They're, they're pretty laid back in the winter time. They're cold blooded, so yeah, their metabolism gets really here. low in the winter. Okay. They only eat about maybe every four yeah, to six weeks in the winter time. Yeah, then, Look at the size of that big male yeah, gator on the left hand there. side over there against that other bank. It's swimming up the river. Oh, oh yeah, see, look at that. Even from this distance, I can tell it's a male. Our female gators don't get that big. He's probably pushing 
maybe 10, 11, 10, 11 feet. Yeah. 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 They'll be over there by the time we get over there. Oh a lot of the, this time of the day when the sun is shining really bright on the opposite shore, the gators like to hang out in the sun. That's a big gator. That's a big gator right there. As we're continuing down the river, if you look through the trees on the right side of the boat, you'll notice behind the tree line that there's an elevated meadow that sits back there. And many years ago, they determined that that was probably a village site for some of the Native American tribes that lived on the river here. So we brought a group of archaeologists in, and they went up in there, and they dug about a half a dozen test pits up there looking for artifacts. And sure enough, they ended up finding hundreds of them. Uh, stone tools, arrowheads, pottery shards. And they carve it, dated them back to about 12 to 15,000 years ago. So we've had civilizations living on this river as far back as 15,000 years. Uh, the Apalachee Indians were here for a couple thousand years. The Greek Indians were here for a couple thousand years. Even the Seminoles were here for a while. And we had two or three other groups of uh, Native American tribes. They didn't have formal names, uh, but they lived here for quite a few thousand years as well. To so give you an idea of how old and ancient this river sides of it as far back as 15,000 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> These little birds coming up in the middle of the river, those are the moorheads I was talking about earlier. Those are the cousins of the, uh, the coops that we have here. And they live here year-round. There's a turtle swimming. I know, I saw it. Now you'd be very happy to know that all the coops that we have here in the park, all the old coops here in the park, <laughs> except me, I probably go. see a male. Some of the males are still around. The males have a beautiful black and white hood of feathers on top of their head, but those are female hooded mergansers there, and they're migratory as well. They, uh, most of our migratory birds will probably be leaving in the next month or so. They go up to the Chesapeake Bay base and spend their summers up there. This is the part of the river I like to shut the motor off and just kind of float with the current a little bit. We had an old-timey boat captain here, worked 38 years here at the park, and uh, this is one of his favorite things to do, so I stole this from him. He was here for so long, we called him the mayor. I was Joel Jeff Hicks. He still comes around here. He like to shut the motor off and kind of look Uh, the one you just talked about are the water and mullet. We have a lot of mullet. You always see swimming in the boat, but we have big, big spotted gar here. We've got uh, large mouth and small mouth bass. Up in the main spring at about 60 feet, we've got massive cats that live up there. And then a uh, little brim. There's about six or eight different varieties. Can you hear the bird? Can you hear it? You tell us it's getting to be breeding season. Yeah. The birds are getting pretty ramped up. The gators are getting pretty ramped up, too. <laughs> Well, the gears, They'll eat anything they can get their teeth on. They eat turtles, birds, fish, uh, mammals. Big gar I see them drag white-tailed deer into the river. Big gar pike. They'll eat rangers in uniform. They're not particularly I don't know my fish at all. Thanks for calling They're the only animal we have on the river here that'll actually eat each other. The gators will eat each other. The only thing they won't eat, believe it or not, are manatees. Manatees have no natural predators. Uh, you can see how big they are. They can actually kill an alligator. Yeah, there's the another spotted gar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Alligators don't typically mess with the gator with the uh, manatees. Spotted gar right there. They're, they got that the big old paddle tail. They can actually break the back of an alligator with the tail. Yeah, they're very, very nice. Like 1,500 pounds of feet are normal. For manatees, well, they don't have any natural predators, unfortunately. Man, is their, is their main issue. Um, no, 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 they're protected. Uh, they're, oh, they probably did, yeah, back then. But, um, yeah, nowadays, they're just losing their habitat. That's the biggest problem. So as we pull into this channel, take a minute to look to the right and look down the river. 
we still have two more miles of river inside the park that we don't get to go down into. That's our sanctuary down there. And two times a year, once in the winter and once in the summer, our park biologist goes down there in a canoe to do a wildlife survey. Those are the only two days a year that humans are allowed on that two-mile section of river. So what you're basically looking at, I don't even get to go down there as a park ranger. And that's basically the last two miles of completely untouched river in the entire state of Florida. And we're lucky enough to have it here. We'll call it spring. So we, we take the conservation of that two-mile stretch of river pretty seriously. And it, it won't be too long. We have thousands of birds that come in here every year. And they use that two-mile stretch of right their rookery. They'll make their nest and uh, kind of raise their chicks down there. It's a very, very important body of water here at the park. Yeah, it's completely undeveloped and it's not, and it doesn't get any human, except for those two days a year when they go down in a canoe, it's the only time they go down there. Um, I only, in my entire time here, I've only had, won the lottery twice where I was able to go down in the canoe with a park biologist. Now the wildlife we see down there is identical to what we see here. Yeah, I was looking to see if I could see it again. We should see some more of those. It's called an American white ibis. Um, I just saw it from zipping around the corner. There goes a little blue heron just flew down the river. Mm -hmm. Now we're on the alligator side of the river. They like to hang over on this side when the sun is so they can kind of warm themselves up. So we should definitely see a bunch up on this side of the river. Keep our eyes open. The stumps, those are called cypress knees. They're actually extensions of the root. So the roots go into the mud of the river and turn around and come back up again. And that's what gives the trees their stability is all those extra uh, all those extra cypress knees sticking out of the water like that. This is an interesting channel that we're driving in right now. It's created by the mainland on the right and this island on the left. And uh, that island out there is not really much of an island, it's mostly floating vegetation. But it's a pretty popular area for some of our female gators to make their nest. They like to the nest on that island if they can. Oh, there's one laying in the north, yeah. If the gators can make their nest uh, on that island, it keeps the raccoons and the armadillos from sneaking out there and stealing the eggs out of their nest. So the female, she'll push a bunch of that vegetation together with her nose into a big pile. And then she'll dig a hole in the middle of it and lay her eggs. That's probably one of our rhythm females over here laying on the edge. There's an American white ibis on the left as well. Now we're going to probably see a bunch of little baby gators in this. Here's a little tiny one on the right. Hopefully we'll see some little... Oh, we got another female on the left. Showing us those snaggle teeth. Most places in Florida, if gators would see a coat this big with all these people on it, they would take off, they'd go in the water, or they'd go back in the weed. Our gators, though, are actually, uh, they're so used to seeing these tour boats out here, it doesn't bother them at all. And we're actually, this is the last state park in Florida where we still use park rangers as our boat captains. All the other parks now have gone to, uh, they've used the outside staffing services for their boat captains. They do a pretty good job, but they have a tendency to interact with the animals a little bit more than we're comfortable with. And they'll throw marshmallows at the gators to get them to come over to the boat. As park rangers, we know marshmallows are not part of an alligator's normal diet, so we let them eat what they're supposed to eat. That's a pretty big one right there. That's not a female, that's a male. When they start getting that, females are about six to eight feet, and the males get to be about eight to 14 feet. Now you can't see that gator's tail, there's about three feet of it in the water there, but he's probably pushing about nine or ten feet. Yeah, he's, he's got his tail in there trying to moderate his body temperature. Let's see if we can find ourselves some little babies. The ones that were born last spring are only about 18 inches long, so hopefully we'll see some of those little tiny ones up here. So just keep your eyes on either side of this channel, because they move around from side to side during the course of the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a baby. There's 
Now that one there, that's that female. She lays there pretty much every day because this is usually where I check people's boat tickets to make sure they're supposed to be on my boat. And she's, she's waiting for free breakfast, but everybody's got a boat ticket this morning. So, and the kids are behaving themselves. So, no, no phone for the gator. That's a big male right there. Look at that. That's huge. The one on the, the, one on the left. Ooh, he's flipping his head Let's see, the one on the right is a male, the one on the left is a female. And the only reason I know that is because two male alligators would never lay that close to each other. They're very, uh, they're very territorial. So the males and the females are starting to pair off now for the breeding season. He's fine with sharing his beach with a female, but he would not tolerate that if that was another male. That's a lily. We got some little babies coming up here on the beach, to the, up, up on here on the right hand side. It won't be too long. We see some vicious alligator fights out here between males that are trying to uh, go into another male's territory. Like the others. And uh, it's pretty horrific to watch them go at it when they just alligator. on each other. But usually they'll stop before it gets uh, too out of control. Usually the smaller one will venture off. We humans are different sometimes. And we got some, this is actually an old, this is an old alligator nest from last spring. There's a female probably around here. She pretty much goes back to the same spot every year. Now when gators are that size, when they're under five feet, from the time they're born until they're about five feet long, they grow about a foot a year. And then once they get to be about five feet, their growth rate slows down quite a bit. It's kind of dictated by how much food they get on an annual basis. We got little baby gators hanging out all over the bay over here. And you can see that uh, little gators learn from their parents at a very young age how to do absolutely nothing. And they're doing really good. They're really doing a really good job of it. You know, people think that these alligators are really aggressive. Oh, bunch of guys are another one. Actually, the alligators are pretty lazy. They find this funny spot. They're happy to hang out there. Here's an Anhinga. She's got her wings all spread out. I've been out of the park for a little while. It's amazing how much the edge of the river's greened up since last time I was out here on the river. All these uh, plants that you see, them, the arrowhead shaped leaf, it's called the uh, payroll leaf. And it was a pretty important food source back thousands of years ago. If you pull those plants out of the ground, they have little tubers underneath, look a lot like potatoes. And that's how the Native Americans used to treat them. They'd boil them off or make a paste out of them and make flatbread. But uh, because they grow in the water like that, they regenerate pretty quickly. So they never had a problem with over harvesting them. And they were thick roll, thick roll weed. Yep. So check out this hand hanger right here. Look at, the, look at the green eyeliner he's got on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a male. And the males get that green. They only get it for about four to six weeks in the spring. That's what they use to attract females. The rest of the year, he won't have that green around his eyes like that. But it gets beautiful. It's a beautiful blue-green color. And that's what he uses. Uh, he uses it to attract his, the females out here. It's an anhinga. Nice. Yeah, a male anhinga. A monster male gator up here on the shore. Now, even though we can't see the full length, of some of his tails in the water. The easiest way to tell how big he is is look at his nose. If you look at the end of his snout, where his nostrils are, and you estimate how many inches it is from the end of his snout back to his eyes, and then you multiply every inch by a foot, that'll tell you how long he is. So he's about 12 inches from the end of his nose to his eyes, so that equals about a 12-foot gator. It's a pretty accurate way to tell how long they are, even if they're kind of submerged in the water. One inch times a foot of the length of their nose. That's also the reason they don't have alligators up in Canada. They still use the metric system up there. They have no way of measuring alligators. That only works. That only works down here in the United States. Now I can get away with this. See my name, French Canadian. My parents are French. I could throw my own countrymen under the bus. <laughs> yeah, he's about 12 feet. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good sized male gator. The females, when they make their nest in the spring, they lay about 40 to 60 eggs. And uh, it takes them about 60 days to incubate. 
the gators don't actually, the females don't lay on the nest. They actually make it out, the nest out of vegetation. And when that vegetation starts to break down like a compost pile, it creates its own heat. And that's the heat that actually incubates the alligator eggs. Now last year we had a lot of hot weather during the breeding season for the gators. And uh, if the inside temperature of that nest gets to be 94 degrees or hotter, the baby. all the baby gators will come out as males. And a manatee with a baby. Oh, speaking of little baby, look, there's a mom and a baby right out in the middle right there. Over there. Look at that. Manatee right there. Oh, manatee. Yeah, mom and a baby manatee out there. Oh, oh right there. Oh, there's some even closer. There's another big one right down here. Oh, she's coming over there. She misses me. She doesn't see me in a couple of weeks. You picked a great time to come here because people come out on these boat tours in the summertime begging us to see manatees. And they're not here in the summer. Usually when the weather warms up in the Gulf, waters get warm. They take off to the Gulf of Mexico and they'll be out there all summer. They won't come back again. Oh, he's going to come out for air. So you picked a great time to come here. We got migratory birds. We got manatees here. There's three. Yeah, there's three of them here. They can be uh, in an environment like this. They can get almost six oh, years old. Dancer. But the females, their breeding, their breeding window is about seven years to about 20 years after 20 years they basically uh, what is it yeah just hanging out checking this out so they can live to be about 60 years old we got a beautiful little blue heron here on the right probably one of the prettiest birds we have in the park always wants to grow up to be a great blue heron but it never will it's a completely different species Oh, he's in the water. So you can see the female in. You see how she's got that blonde neck and shoulders? It's kind of it's easy, to, easy to tell. And you see how pointy her beak is. That's what she uses for spearing fish underwater. Oh, there's a big manatee. Oh, manatee. We got another manatee out in the middle of the river. I'm trying to keep a running count in my head here for our park biologist. We actually set a new record this year, Christmas week. We had 60 manatees this year in the river. Our old record was 54. And uh, they were hanging out at the top of the river there, up by the dive tower. And it was a lot of fun having that many of them here in the water. Oh, it's it's right the right 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 right. There's a green blue heron, yep, on the left-hand side. Standing, that's the biggest bird we have in the park. Stands about four feet tall. It's got about a four and a half foot wingspan. And believe it or not, that bird is the biggest predator of baby alligators out here on the river. You would think it would be uh, raccoons or possums, but when gators are first born, when they first come out of the egg, they're only about five inches long. They're definitely small enough for those big birds like that to grab a couple of them and fly out of the nest. So, female gators got to be on top of her game, protecting her young from those uh, from those birds like that. There's another big manatee in the shallow water. Boy, it's a real treat having the water this clear. Being able to see all the way across the river, manatees swimming from one oh, side yeah, to the yeah, side. Yeah. Now you can probably get a good view of that osprey up in that nest in the middle of the river there from here. There's another two manatee. Two more. That pair, uh, they made that nest four years ago. Here's one on the one. Slow and right down. after they finished making it, a pair of bald eagles came sleeping. in here. And they thought that they were going to steal Slow that down nest a away bit. from those ospreys. Here's one right here eating. And uh, those ospreys weren't going to have any part of that. They fought those eagles off for three to four weeks. Oh, we got all kinds of manatees here. That's like 12 we've already seen today. You almost ate your lucky charms this morning. There's a baby. And it's got a little baby. baby. There's a baby. Two mamas and babies. Another big male oh, gator on the right hand side. There's the Oscar. Got another gator swimming in the water here. There's the Osprey on the nest. Alligators are actually what we call ambush. Look at that little baby. Look at a tiny little. It's a little. That's great. When the weather's warm like this, they all come out of the water. They're hard to see when they're in the water like that.
Oh, they are. You'll see some that are this big. Yeah, they'll stay in the nest for about two to three oh, years. Because yeah. females, females are very uh, protective of their young. And they can actually tell which one are theirs. So, they'll, so the baby, that's why the babies will kind of hang around in the area where they were born for a few years. They get a little bit of size to them and then they can venture off into the main river. Johnny Weismuller was quite the comedian. They, rumor has it when he would stay at the lodge in the morning, he'd throw open the windows of his guest room and lean out and he'd felt out his trademark Tarzan yell. And that was, that was his way to let the chef in the kitchen downstairs know he was coming down for breakfast. And he was quite the, uh, quite the character. Now those movies, those Tarzan movies did so well that people in Hollywood saw them. They wanted to find out where they were filmed so they could come here and do their movies here in the mid-1950s, right in this S-turn that we're driving through. 
one of the most iconic horror movies of the 1950s was filmed. Anybody want to guess what it was? That's exactly right. This is where they filmed the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> right in this little S-turn here of the river. They did a lot of it up in the main screen as well, but a lot of it was done back in this back channel. And they actually did three creature movies. The first one and the third one were done here at Wakulla Springs. Uh, the second one, Creature's Revenge, that was actually done down at Silver Springs, a little bit farther south in Florida. Well, we think the creature likes Wakulla Springs better because we still see him hanging out here sometimes in the summertime and enjoying his retirement, laying on a log, soaking up the sun. And creature's, creature's like, he's like 80 years old now. He's not much of a threat to humans anymore, so we're happy to have him spending his retirement here. There's normally a whole bunch of those black vultures hanging around back here, but the weather must be warm enough for them to venture out and look for things to eat. And poor vultures, you know, they don't get any respect. They're like the Rodney Dangerfield of the bird world. And, but uh, they're a really important part of the food chain. We see them out there eating all kinds of nasty things on the side of the road. But they really do have a, a really important place in the food chain in Florida or in the United States, period. There are vultures in pretty much all 48 of the lower states. Yeah, well, they don't, they're not uh, raptors, though. They're, they actually have turkey feet. They, have, uh, they don't have talons like a, a hawk or an eagle. So they have to go after the carrion. That's why they eat things that are dead like that. These white ibis, they use that long orange feet to poke around in the mud. Oh, here's a beautiful flower on the right. It's called a spider lily, just starting to come out this time of the year. Yeah, pretty soon that whole bunch of them right there is going to be full of blossoms. Baby gator over here. Yeah. I think that was multiple flowers on a stem, but that's one flower that helped take they are. Nope, that's an anhinga. The easy way to tell, the cormorants have a hook beak at the end of their beak and the and the and have the real pointy needle beak. Side, but this is actually the outflow from the Sally Ward Spring. Uh, it's up there by the ranger station. You may have noticed it on the left when you first came into the park. So it's pretty tiny and the water from that spring comes down about half a mile and dumps into the main river here. But it only contributes about 2% of the water volume to the river. The other 98% comes out of the main okay. spring. Oh, what? That's a big you can drink it if you, if you really want it. I mean, you've got to realize there's a lot of animals that live in it, but in a pinch, you could probably drink the water here. There's another big gator hanging out here on the right. Yeah. These guys have no concern for the tour boats at all. They're more than happy to just sit there. They figure if they get in the water, they're going to get cold. They don't want to give up their sunny beach. They just watch the boats go by. And Plus they know that we're not out here to antagonize them. For most of our boat tour today, we've been running at about five to eight feet of water. You've been able to see the bottom of the river. Well, now we're coming into this area up in front of us. This is what we call the spring bowl. This is about a four acre body of water here where the spring is located. On this side here, the water is going to drop down to about 60 feet deep on this side of the spring bowl. You're going to watch the bottom of the river. It's going to disappear underneath us. And then when I swing over by the dive tower, it's going to drop down to 125 feet deep. And that's where the cave opening is located. So the cave itself is pretty huge. It's about as wide as a four-lane highway. It stands about six stories tall. And that's the size that it needs to be to let, the, to let that 75 million gallons of water come out. Massive turtles over here called Suwannee Cooters. They're the largest turtles 
that we have in the river here. And uh, you can hear what they sound like when an alligator gets a hold of them. They, uh, like a drawbreaker for an alligator, but alligators have 2,500 pounds per square inch of bite force. So a turtle shell is no uh, is, is no match for an alligator bite. We got our volunteer crew is out here on the river today. They come out every Thursday and they check the clarity of the spring. It's been a while. Yeah, these are these are big catfish laying down here at the bottom of the river. Yeah, I haven't seen the water this clear in quite a while. The water is pretty clear right now. Well, the problem is the water that's coming out of the spring today was rainfall probably 30 to 45 days ago. It takes down the water. This is a massive aquifer. It's about 200 square miles. It goes all the way up to Alaska into South Georgia. It takes a long time for the water to actually work into the ground and come out the spring here. <coughs> what was it? What? That little shed over there on the right, that used to be, it's a pump house. Way back in the 30s when Ed Ball first built the lodge, they used to pump water out of the spring and they'd pump it through radiators in the, uh, inside the lodge for air conditioning. Because the water is 69 degrees all year long. Uh, so they basically would pump it out, run it through the lodge, and we still do pull water out of the spring. It kind of it gives the existing HVAC system a little bit of assistance. Uh, but it's actually it was a, it was one of the first buildings in Florida to have air conditioning, and they used the cold water out of the spring to actually cool the building. You get a really nice view of the lodge from out here on the water. It was built back in the mid-30s by Ed Ball. And believe it or not, he built that back then as a private residence. He's got a 27-bedroom, he's got a full-service restaurant, full-service ice cream parlor. And he kept it private for about 20 years for his friends and family. Finally, in the 50s, enough people started bugging him to want to stay here. He's paying gas. He opened it up as a lodge in the 1950s. Yeah, I haven't seen this clear. Yeah. yeah, he actually, uh, Ed Ball's sister married into the DuPont family. And Ed Ball became well, one of the financiers for the DuPonts. And he would buy and sell a lot of real estate for the DuPonts. And he would take his little piece of the pie of every time he did a transaction. That's how he made his money. Way back when television was first invented, Ed Ball decided he didn't want any televisions in any of the guest rooms of his lodge. So when we took this property over in 1986 as a state park, the park system decided that they were going to honor his wishes. So to this day, we have no televisions in any of our guest rooms here at the lodge. We want people to come. Yeah, we want people to come down here, enjoy Mother Nature, and kind of recharge a little bit. So we left the lodge just the way it was back in the 1930s. Except the mattresses. We have changed the mattresses. <laughs> Nobody wants to sleep on a 90-year-old mattress. That elevator is original. It's the oldest Art Deco elevator in Florida. They're actually today they got a, they got people coming in. They're getting ready to uh, renovate it, um, and it's a pretty intense process because they want to keep it looking yeah, natural yeah. like it was when they built this. So they're going to renovate it. It's got to, we got to bring it up to code a little bit. It's still operating. We use it every day.
Uh, as we come into the dock, I'm going to ask everybody to grab a seat real quick, uh, just in case I rub against one of these pilings.